we're here to discuss sustainable investing. It is front and centre of the public psyche now more than ever, what with the crisis of war dominating the start of 2022. Mathilde Dufour, Head of Sustainability Research, is here to shed light on how Morova believes that the key to success with sustainable investing lies within the importance of being selective. Mathilde, thank you very much for joining us. We're also joined by Dr Nisha Long, Head of ESG and Cross-Border Investment Research, to also shed light on what it means to be investing sustainably in today's market. Thank you both so much for joining us today. Sustainable investing is clearly a fast growing market and investors have had to adapt really quickly to the changing landscape. What do you see as the main challenges to investing in ESG in today's environment? When we look at um, ESG investing, I mean, there has been so uh, much progress over the last years. Uh, if you look at today's uh, end of uh, last year's, looking at the number of Article 9 or Article 8 funds, which are under the EU regulations funds, which have some ESG credentials, they represent over one third of all the funds distributed in the EU. And more than that, it, it represents two thirds of the inflows. So when we look at that, that we could say, well, there has been a, a, a long way, uh, but um, that comes with uh, some challenges. Um, and for that, we have the regulation, which is going to help uh, through increased transparency requirements, among others. If we take two of the uh, emblematic um, regulations, which is in Europe, the green taxonomy and the SFDR, and they will both come with some challenges in terms of companies and financial institutions having to report on the proportion of green investment. So in terms of challenges, I would say, you know, we have been progressing a lot, uh, but at the same time, that means that we have to be accountable more than we did before. And that means a lot of uh, progress in terms of quality of the data and the ability to really measure it, the environmental and social impacts. ESG covers so much ground and the sheer amount of different data out there, um, which is not aligned, can make analyzing ESG, well, the ESG factors quite difficult. Um, so, for example, if you take ESG rating agencies that assess risks, there's no standard at all there either. So for somebody like me, you know, researching these, um, it is very difficult to see, you know, cut through that noise to find what is, you know, the actual impact um, of those different metrics on a risk basis and to see where the opportunities are also. And as Mathilde mentioned, the EU taxonomy, you know, it has helped to bring some sort of standardization um, within this process, but it's still blurred. So what do you think are the key metrics that investors should be mindful of when looking at sustainable offerings? Um, I would say that the first thing to look at is really to say, to answer the question, does the asset manager really, really state its intention to finance the transition towards a greener economy or a more inclusive society? So intention is still key and that will drive the whole process of the sustainable investment behind. The second question is that if you, in my view, want to achieve uh, this intention, you, you need to invest a lot in your workforce, in your expertise, in the methodology. So looking at, you know, is there a dedicated team? How, what are the profiles of this team? Um, what is the methodology and how robust is it? Uh, are key are key metrics at Mirova. We have dedicated um, uh, uh, strong resources and, and a large team team since its inception uh, to make sure that we have this strong expertise of issues which can go from CO two measurements to human rights protection to data privacy. And lastly, I would say that you know having looked at the intention, the resources. Uh, you then need to look at the impact measurement, which is a big topic in the, in the industry. Let's turn to look at the environment in specific and explore the fact that climate mitigation is more urgent now than ever before. Mathilde, how can this play into investors' portfolios, particularly if they want to be net zero? Um, I think, you know, looking at car carbon neutrality, um, it's interesting because uh, it will require actually achieving this uh, carbon neutrality, the emergence of new business models, new technologies, new solutions, as we saw in, 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 in the IPCC report. But more, most of all, it implies the in-depth transformation of companies' current business models. So that can be you know, choosing some statuses where they can align their business model with the current challenges. We have the B Corp certification, the mission-driven companies in France, 
all these kinds of organizations can also translate into future environmental and, and uh, social positive impact. And ultimately, that would also imply from a climate perspective, uh, in the end of the process, if you're not managing to properly engage with companies of capital flows into companies that are reluctant to climate change. Mm. Nisha, you've written a lot about dirty energy's dominance right now in this sector. What, what do you think are the main risks and opportunities investors need to be aware of? Yes, so um, dirty energy, um, when I refer to this, is such an old, um, is oil and coal, which has dominated this year. And coal was one of the actual the best performing assets or commodity assets of last year. And that's been due to a number of um, reasons. Um, one is opening up of the economies after the COVID um, pandemic, so after lockdowns, and also supply issues of other energy sources that we're seeing now. And um, this movement to renewable energy is not as clear cut you know, as it seems. It may take decades you know, to implement certain infrastructure and see the, you know, the impact of these investments coming through. And some of the raw materials that go into providing you know, these, this infrastructure for renewable energies is very expensive at the moment. And again, that's because of what the COVID pandemic brought with supply chain issues. Not that people don't want to go into these renewable sources, etc. But it is quite expensive to go into these at the moment. And as Mathilde you know, mentioned before, it's about engagement. Let's review the S of ESG and talk about the social taxonomy. Obviously, it's been put in place to define what a social investment is. But what's your take on the proposal to introduce a common language? So definitely, it is of tremendous importance to have uh, you know, the same kind of exercise on the social issue that what we had on the environmental one. Um, just one figure, uh, you know, it's estimated that if we want to achieve the UN SDGs, which encompass a lot of social objectives, we'll need an additional uh, $3 trillion uh, a year in developing countries. So the need is here. And if we want to direct capital flows to these social objectives, we'll need at some point some standardization. Uh, and in that sense, having a social taxonomy is definitely a good, uh, a good way to do it. But how to do it, that's typically the question. But if we want to really uh, have a, a social taxonomy that will work as a tool to direct capital flows towards activities with a truly substantial social contribution, the criteria must be more specific. You have to ask yourselves, so these jobs, are they respectful of labor rights? Are they paid enough? Are they sustainable jobs? On the social side, um, there is little science. It's more international values, convention agreements. And there raises the questions on, you know, the, the kind of cross-border factors that you will integrate in the criteria. And that's where the complexity lies. But, you know, having said that, um, it's still important to have maybe a non-perfect um, taxonomy, but still try to identify what could be beyond avoiding the negative impact, uh, something that will positively contribute to, to societal goods. Is it, more, is it uh, more beneficial to have an imperfect taxonomy than to not have one at all? Absolutely. It is so encouraging to see the social taxonomy and it's very welcome. I know it's at the early stages, but I think what I've seen so far of it, it can make a good impact on what we're trying to do. It is so hard to measure a social impact. So for any kind of standardization in that process would make it a lot easier for us. And I think that's why it has been neglected in the past, because there's no tangible data there that you can measure. Nisha, Mathilde, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for, but I thank you for your insight into sustainable investing in this unstable market. Thank you. Mm -hmm.